Today, um, we're really fortunate to have Christopher Ulova, who, as many of you know, is one of our new faculty members here at SBCC. Um, he um, received his MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design and his BFA from the Tyler School of Art at Temple University. He has exhibited extensively, um, including solo exhibitions at Susan English Gallery in New York, as well as um, group exhibitions, including First Contact at Field Projects, Nature Once Removed, The Unnatural World and Contemporary Drawing at Lehman College, Make, and uh, Tales of Wonder and World Fable and Fairy Tale and Contemporary Art at Castle Gallery. He is also the co-curator and, and an exhibitor in uh, the current exhibit, In Search Of, which has been traveling around the country and is about to open on February 22nd in Brooklyn at T. And our museum. Please welcome me, join me, and welcome me, Christopher. Thanks, guys. Can you hear me this at this volume? Can you hear me this volume? Towards the front, so he doesn't have to yell all the way to the back. Those of you who are just coming in, okay? Please in. Okay. Uh, can you hear me at like this volume? Pretty good. What? No, it's no. No. The, um, I'm gonna let the first one go, and then I'm going to um, I'm gonna deal with the hecklers. Um, I feel like you're an easy one, too, um, but I'm going to let it go, buddy, um, this time. Everybody has a weakness. You just need to find it, go in there and get it. That's the key to dealing with hecklers. But you guys can hear me then? Yeah, decent? This is about the best I could do. It's been a pretty long day. Um, I am going to thank you for coming. I know it was, like, not next door, so this is actually a pretty good decent sized crowd, um, but we'll go for quality over quantity um, for now. So Christopher Levo got here in the fall. It's a pleasure to meet some of you. I feel like I'm still meeting a lot of people who are involved in the art department. Um, and we'll just get going, OK? So a little bit about how I organize this. Um, I kind of, you know, I've had, had to give these talks before in the past really just in the past like three years, I guess, I've been doing them a little bit more. And it's kind of easy um, to make a really nice, neat arc from like when you first started to kind of like where you are and make it seem like it was perfectly logical that everything that you did was like one step um, getting you to where you are, as if it was like destiny or something. I think the terms, uh, tele like in history, it's teleological, right? When you feel like there was no end result but the result that came at the end, you know? Like it could have been nothing, you know, there could have been no alternate path. Um, and I always feel a little bit, you know, kind of like, um, I always feel a little bit like a liar, you know what I mean? It's sort of, you make it seem like there's really, uh, uh, everything's logical, you know, all the decisions you make. And also I think the big thing um, that gets left out is um, circumstance, you know? Um, like where you were born, who you were born with, all those things I think are really, you know, gigantic factors. Coincidence, um, luck, bad and good. You know, I think, I don't know how you guys feel, but I feel personally, um, especially career-wise, I don't know about personality-wise, uh, sort of interpersonal relationships, but, you know, sometimes you get things you don't deserve and sometimes you um, deserve things, but you never get them, you know. So um, I tried to kind of, uh, come on guys, 4.30. Uh, I'm trying to kind of um, reconfigure a little bit to have some more room for those kind of things. And maybe uh, I put in some biographical stuff because I think in a way it might help color the last body of work, which is the stuff I'm really interested in talking to you guys about, which is from 2009 to the present. I feel like I'm at a plateau, to be perfectly honest, um, work-wise, where I'm really, really comfortable with how I make things right now. Um, but like the bigger questions when I go into the studio are about like why I make things and what I'm making, what my motivations really are. So the things I'm going to talk a little bit about today with you guys are um, sort of biography, just to sort of like um, color the, the end work, see where I'm coming from. And then I think more importantly is my research method, um, if you can call it a method, which is something I was always pretty em like almost embarrassed of or like squeamish to talk about because it's... Um, it's sort of loose and broad, like very broad and kind of shallow, 
research, you know, instead of like pinpointing um, or instead of having comprehensive knowledge of art history and like pinpointing these connections and making a line to where I am to these other kind of famous artists of the past, my interests are, you know, like the mighty Mississippi is what I'm saying. Broad and the, the flooded Nile, that's better. The flooded Nile, right? I like, there's all sorts of things I'm interested in. A lot of it's not art related, but it's kind of, I think, now the more interesting part of what I'm doing. It might not necessarily be the painting is how I'm painting things, but what I'm painting, how the narratives work. So, taking a step back, um, let's start. Let me see if this works. Oh, there you go. That works. We'll get some of the biological stuff. Uh, biological. I was thinking about the guy, this guy. Um, getting the um, biographical stuff out of the way, right? Um, I feel like where you come from, at least for me, was, was really very important. Uh, in as much, can we get that door? Does somebody mind getting that door? Or at least tell those people to shut up. How dare they talk in the hallway? Okay. Um, again, that whole thing, I feel like it's very, very, very unlikely. I feel, you know, if you were to go back in time, or if you were going to place a bet when I was like 14, what I would be when I grew up, I certainly didn't think artist would be it, you know? I would never think that. And um, the place I grew up, um, I think, really colors my, my whole view of the world. Um, and it's also a place I didn't really like, you know, so I don't know if people are familiar with Staten Island. It's, um, I grew up in Staten Island, Brooklyn, and it's this very kind of, um, especially when I was growing up, it was almost all Italian and sort of slightly Jewish, but this kind of uh, blue-collar, white ethnic, very aggressive, like a really kind of aggressive place. It's like money and sort of like uh, um, fighting, you know, all these kind of things were really important. Pizza was very important, very heavy food, you know. Um, and also, the one thing I thought which actually was kind of interesting is that, at least for me, I grew up with a lot of people who were much older, like that sort of World War II generation. And, and even up until I moved here, I was living um, with all these people who were part of that generation. And like those guys were kind of this very storied, you know, the children of the Depression, World War II, you know, this sort of gangster era. And uh, also, I spent a lot of time with people who, you know, didn't go to school. Um, but still had resources. So, you know, like a lot of my uncles and, and people, you know, were like functionally illiterate, but kind of savvy, but very savvy. And so, you know, I didn't fit in with that group. You know, I was kind of more um, sort of introverted. I like to kind of play with myself. It was mostly like Legos and stuffed animals. You know, I wasn't tough. So I did definitely felt like that was the, um, each place has its own kind of currency. Like LA is celebrity. New York is kind of money and toughness, right? So I had neither of those, those things. So I kind of walled myself off and played with Legos and stuffed animals, quite in the same way I do now. Um, so that's where I come from. I guess, you know, it's equally likely that I would be a rodeo clown as I would have been an artist. But um, luckily for me, the first step um, to sort of being able to have any sort of finding what I was interested in was going to a really great high school, you know? And I kind of feel like crediting it, crediting it uh, with being the first step to becoming an artist is, especially because it had no, there was no art program in my high school, which I feel is like a great blessing in a weird way. Um, it was a science and engineering school. So it was electrical engineering, math, uh, like a computer, all this kind of stuff that was, there's, you know, and there's no art program, there's no at anything at all. I was very bad at those program, I was very bad at those classes, you know. Um, and so I got way more interested in history and English, right? And I sort of would be in plays and do all these other things. And it was just really kind of very, very safe. I mean, you could see those kids at the bottom, like that's, that's who it was, you know? It was like a, a, a sort of like a, a kind of UN, a UN of nerddom. So like um, in that way, it was like a really great place to flourish. I was so used to hanging out with these kind of like beefy, tough guys, you know, and then you get in this place where everybody's kind of valued for other things. Um, and I think by learning that I wasn't going to go down this path of architecture and engineering, that I just didn't have the temperament, especially I didn't have the discipline um, and rigor, it actually really helped. I sort of defined myself in the negative, right? <laughs> I knew I wasn't going this way, even though I liked the place. And so, uh, and my parents um, wisely noticed that I, I wasn't doing well. I could do really well in standardized tests, but I wasn't doing well in school. Um, and they 
um, were sort of like knew that I doodled and I did this kind of plays and stuff. And so I guess from a friend of a friend, they found out about a Saturday program at Cooper Union, which is in the city. It's a very famous school, free school. Lincoln spoke there, you know, um, art, science, and art, architecture, and engineering school. Um, and you had to apply for this program. And so I had just been making kind of um, weird sketches and, and sort of drawings on my own for a long time. And they said, well, let's just go there and we'll sit there and, and, and try and do it. And, you know, I, have no, I had no, absolutely zero frame of reference. I don't know, how, I'm, maybe I'd been in a museum once in my whole life up to that point. Um, so I didn't really have an understanding of what art was, you know. And I, I remember my drawings, I don't have pictures of them, but I do remember them. It was like, I think there's one of a, um, guy with a Fu Manchu, like riding a brontosaurus, and there was uh, these drawings of these uh, men, there, there were sort of tomato heads on the bodies of men, and they had machetes, and they were, they were chopping up like polar bears, or, you know, it was just these very strange little things that I'd make, and uh, I rolled them up, and I brought them to this, this place, and um, waited, and I was like number 276 or something, like all these high school students with the big portfolios, and I just had these rubber bands, you know, I had no idea what I was doing, but Luckily for me, I was at the end of the day, and um, it's actually this person. Uh, uh, this is an artist who, who kind of was reviewing my work. It turned out she became a really well-known artist much later on. Her name is Wangichi Mutu. Um, you know, after looking at all these kind of portfolios of nice sort of figure drawings in charcoal, which were, you know, kind of well done, she sees this kind of rolled up mess of like dinosaurs and tomato men killing. And it must have seemed like a breath of fresh air, you know, for her. And she's like, oh yeah, I remember, you know, it, it was like this first big compliment I felt like I got. Um, she was also out, outrageously beautiful, so it was this kind of whole package for me. I was just sort of like this glowing lady telling me, she's like, oh yeah, she's like, oh yeah, you're a painter, you know? And I know what she said, I was probably thinking something else, but I knew like she was just like positive on me. And so I got into this program, it was four hours of, of drawing and then four hours of either printmaking and photography. Um, and I had no idea what printmaking was, so I just said, oh, I'll do photography. And again, I was terrible at photography. But, um, uh, you know, being a high school student and having like a four hour drawing class and never had to take in any of our classes, um, you know, in life drawing, it was just, it could have went either way. But I mean, I thought the second I got in there, this kind of weird, dusty, dirty room, all the furniture is like made out of old wood, you know, those kind of saw horses that we have, we have the same ones. Um, it was just like this weird romantic spot for me and I was just like, absolutely, I thought like this is the place I want to spend the rest of my life, you know, like immediately. Um, and, and now it's sort of come true, at least I'm next door to the place. And, um, and so I did that, it was every day, you know, and, and being from Staten Island, there's no going to the city. Especially it was dangerous at that time. You never, you know, so it was my first exposure to the cosmopolitan New York and my first exposure to art of any kind. And it really came from making rather than from like kind of seeing a slide talk, which I think was also a really good thing. My first engagement about learning about what art could be was getting in there and doing it, right, in a kind of pretty advanced way from these guys, which I think uh, the subtext of my talk is don't believe in fate, right? I got very lucky. If it wasn't for my parents taking me there, I'm sure I would have not done it, you know? And then I would have been something else. Uh, I don't know what else, but I would have been something else. Probably uh, sanitation or mailmen. It's not funny. They're good. They get good pensions. Um, so I got enough out of that one class, right? It was like maybe 10 weeks, four hours of drawing. Got up to apply to college and I got into a pretty good school. Um, I'm not including any work because it's just not that important, I guess, at this time, but um, I could just tell you everything was like six feet, you know, and this is where I think I probably didn't go to the right place, really, now I'm thinking about it. You know, um, I didn't know what kind of work I was going to make, but everything was very big, very macho paintings at the time, so if you could imagine, it was um, four years of six and eight foot paintings, you know, big sweeping gestures. Um, and I knew early on, even though we were really encouraged to paint abstractly, lots of colors, we had a lot of color field, teachers who spent their whole life just working with color theory. My interest was more in storytelling, and I always had to like squeeze it in um, into like some sort of color, giant color field painting. So it'd be like big splotches of paint, and I'd like, you know, paint a little moose somewhere so I can get it like, you know, something in there, and paint a little man, you know. Um, the good thing about that was, is maybe it wasn't what I was really interested in, but it did force me to like learn this other thing and sort of get this other experience. Um, 
The other great thing was I got a very peculiar sense of art history. Um, I didn't take a lot of art history classes in undergraduate, and so um, I would just learn sort of from my teachers, but they had peculiar tastes, and, and, and a lot of teachers I worked with didn't get along with each other, and it was kind of reflected in their work, you know. And my two favorite teachers had very different, they didn't like each other, and, and they had to work together one semester, which was like my favorite class in history. It was co-taught by these people who hated each other, couldn't be in the same room. And so Susan Moore is this great woman. She had these kind of like refined sort of um, bravura classical taste. Like she liked kind of work that had a canon of history but had like kind of aggressive mark or aggressive paint. So that's where I learned about Vuillard, you know. And I don't think I would have been able to articulate it at the time, but it just worked. It really worked on me. Like, I, you know, it was instinctual. I see, you know, see a painting like this, um, and I felt that although it seems like a really pleasant painting, there's like all these soft, nice colors layered on top, there's something really kind of dicky about it. You know, there's like, you know, there's like a, in this, there's like a newspaper, like everybody's treated the same, you know. It's like, this is a man, but you can't see his face, and he's made out of little splotches. Like, everything gets treated equally, you know. And I almost felt like a, a third, third wheel or fifth wheel? Fifth wheel you know, in the painting, right? It's like the people are always made out of splotches and you're kind of there and you're sort of a, 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 a view, like, you know, you as the, a, you feel your presence as a viewer in the painting, you know? And it, it almost felt like you're not invited, right? And it was making space out of pattern, you know? And something like this, you know, like by putting like a big, bright, red, attractive, hard-edged thing, it's like the only breathing room in the whole painting, you know? Um, in a corner, it seemed kind of weirdly subversive in a very tasteful painting, you know. Um, I don't think I would have articulated it that way at the time, but I just knew something was working in there. Um, Balthus was always, a, you know, I remember the first time um, seeing Balthus with that same teacher, Susan Moore, and um, again, like really, in a more overt way, putting you as the viewer. Well, for the first thing you think of is like, who the hell is this Baltus guy think he's making? You know what I mean? It's like, it's a beautiful painting, right? And it's just sort of like this really super hot, intense skin with, against that white shirt. And then that kind of, again, this sort of like bright red triangle sort of near the dirty zone. And it's like, you know, first thing, remember the first thought was like, you know, against the artist, like, this guy, this is like, why is, you know, this is crazy. What is he doing? And then you sort of like, you know it's a good painting and you're really interested in the painting. You're like, well... Where is that place you in it? Like, how culpable are you in this scenario? You know? And I also remember thinking, like, I thought I was in college. Like, I don't know if we should be doing, the, you know, this kind of thing in a classroom. All that stuff seemed really great. And I think the smartest thing about it is that there's this, like, veneer of taste and talent on this that I thought was really, like, attractive. Like, that everything's kind of painted well, but a little bit blocky. It's not classical. It has this kind of, like, weird opacity to it, you know? And I think, again, like the way things are arranged, like can, kind of conspicuously arranged, I felt like it wasn't heavy-handed like when you're looking at surrealist work or something where you feel like, okay, this equals this symbol, this equals that symbol. There was something kind of natural about the standpoint of the viewer in this painting, you know, um, that I really didn't get in that kind of surrealist work that I remember seeing in some other places. Right, so it would be loaded. It's still really loaded, right? It's kind of sexually charged, but it's also kind of deadpan in a way. It's a little bit like British humor or something, but Germanic. Um, and this might be my favorite painting ever made. The sort of, I forgot the title. I think it's just called The Mountain, right? But um, it has a lot of what that last painting I showed had, you, had in it. You know, this kind of like just slight, you know, not pornographic, but kind of alluding to these situations and kind of odd rela relationships between uh, the figures. But there's also like a real um, mixing of grandness, like grandeur, and kind of like um, silliness, you know. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of my other influences, uh, you know, non-art influences. And this reminds me a lot of what I love about opera. Um, which is that it's beautiful, but it's also really silly, you know? I think the, um, and somehow the silly, I don't know, the magic is that the silliness kind of heightens the beauty of it. Like, just the way that this, I mean, those of you, maybe we haven't gotten to it in painting class, but I mean, this is pretty, some kind of like oddly hacky painting over here. It's kind of weird green, 
or these splotchy. You know, some of these areas are very sloppy, and some of them are really tender and kind of like lovingly painted. Um, and somehow the sum, the sum is so much greater than the parts. Um, and again, I don't necessarily knew I would articulate it that way. I just knew it was real, these weird paintings were like really effective on me. Um, and I understood that they had some sort of sense of narrative, but it wasn't like a comic book. Like I wasn't being told what to think, you know? I was just, like it was just working on me. And that's something that I had never been a comic book guy. Um, and I, I, I would always be, I was always self-conscious. I felt like I should like comic books, you know, because I like all the things about, but there's something about how, you know, you're always being told what to think, you know, like literally, that everything's spelled out in letters, you know, that really bugged me about them. Um, and so from that other guy who, you know, I'd see those Balthus and those paintings, and then maybe the next day we had the same section of that class, and then I really learned about all these Chicago, these great Chicago painters who sort of had this, um, relationship with cartooning and relationship with um, kind of absurdity, this really absurd, highly graphic style of painting. Um, now I knew I didn't have the sort of chops or the, you know, I was really impulsive. I mean, I guess I remain a bit impulsive. Um, so I didn't really connect with their kind of flat color sort of thing. I was much more of a draftsman, you know, not draftsman, but like sort of loopy handed drawing. Um, but I love the way they put together images and um, maybe not silly, but uh, I guess the absurd is a little bit different than silliness. And again, being that sort of like, you know, late teens, there's this kind of like aggressive and completely, um, what do you call it? Miscomprehensive? That's not a word, is it? No? There's like a kind of misunderstanding of sexuality or like a misrepresentation of sex, sexuality or a kind of a violence associated with it, like this kind of severed um, penis and this kind of weird, this weird uh, symbology, you know? Symbology, is that a word too? No. Symbolism. This kind of weird symbolism and grossness, kind of like really being excited about the grossness of it. H.C. Westerman. I'm not 100% sure. That last guy was Jim Nutt, by the way. I'm sorry. Jim Nutt. The Westerman, I'm not sure if we were looking at it at the time, but again, associated with that same group. Um, there's a kind of rawness in the handling of all the material, but the storytelling was really um, uh, present. Not present, but sort of aggressive in there, right? Almost the opposite of the VR in the beginning, who is like very talented and very slow form of storytelling. It's a really fast form of storytelling, but also very interesting. Some more Westerman. And of course, like, we all love, if I, you know, we, I remember hearing a lot about him sort of having his horrific um, experiences during World War II, sort of like uh, uh, the Pacific and how that kind of like, that inner biography um, kind of came out. Uh, Roger Brown, right? And I think this is somebody who I kind of, did, I had no idea, and maybe I still don't completely understand this guy's motivations. Um, but again, I felt like it had a lot of effect on me, and I think th I would kind of link him with Balthus. Everything's so staged, everything's so kind of set up. You know, there's all these pieces, and the pieces are supposed to work together. But there's always like uh, uh, the main ingredient is enigma, right? It never really adds up to anything completely. Like it's a puzzle that can't really be solved. Um, so this one's like overtly stage-like, right? And then there's this kind of secondary action going on, secondary landscape going on behind the stage, you know? But this idea that I had learned in history class, maybe, from high school, and in reading that you don't want to have, um, you know, the best stories are the ones that don't have like a black hat cowboy and a white hatted cowboy, you know, like good versus bad, but you want that nuance. And seeing these paintings that had so much kind of like, you know, sort of like hyper-narrative uh, content. There's like tons of story going on. Uh, and in a way, that's almost not, sw not what is important. It's kind of like you take a step back and take in the painting as a whole. And then you could go back in and take these little pieces of the narrative. I found that really attractive. And lastly, and most of all, I would say, um, the guy who I really wished I could be, but never could, uh, maybe one day, Robert Colescott. 
forgot where he was born, but he spent most of his, he just passed away, I guess, a couple years ago, but spent most of his life in Arizona. Um, and he was half black and half white, and sort of, he had this kind of interesting, you know, biographical backstory. Um, but he also, I felt like, combined that kind of bravura mark making and a really sophisticated sense of storytelling and a sense of kind of pointed absurdity that, um, seemed like he caught every single thing I was interested in at all. Like, he did it, you know, amazingly well. So in a painting like this, the fact that there's, it looks kind of like chaos, but the composition makes sense. It kind of spirals around counterclockwise. And then you take it in piece by piece. It's kind of like black Mona Lisa. It's kind of like black uh, Mona Lisa in the top right corner. And this kind of like mixed couple in the center. And then somehow he makes like the, the things underneath the guy's arm become a, um, what do you call it, become a, hairdressing salon, you know, and then it's like this kind of infinitely dense layers of narrative and this really like goofy, squishy, but kind of like, I don't know, kind of oddly tackily, tackily, that's not a word either, tacky but beautiful um, mark making and color was just like the most I could hope for, you know, and, and the, the sense that I got that he had a really deep understanding of art history um, and could somehow like felt warranted and like deserved being able to comment on it seemed to me like the most amazing thing you could do. Uh, so if we're still following my chronology, I should probably speed up a little bit. Move to Pittsburgh, which is what happens when you don't know what to do with your life. You move to Pittsburgh because it's very cheap. And it's actually very, very nice city and clean and pretty. Um, but it was my first experience of like being in the real world um, and being out of like New York. I guess I went to school in Philadelphia, but um, I was living on my own, and I was living alone, which was like the most, the greatest miracle of miracles. It's like having, having that time as a kid, like the Lego stuffed animal time, like all the time, right? It's like when you go home, and so I'd make these really elaborate setups in my apartment, and so cheap, I had a two-bedroom apartment for $375, so I had a studio, like right, I would like literally roll out of bed and like go and paint and make stuff and then go back to bed, that kind of thing. Um, so that's my first time having a job, and I feel like my jobs have, for better or worse, influenced a lot of work at work. Um, I wound up working in an art supply store. Um, and it was, you know, I mean, technically speaking, I guess it's a dead-end job. You know, I was making, like, very little money. I didn't need a lot of money, but I was making more money. And I would just sit in this, this art supply store that had a two-story pencil coming out of it. So it was like a, a giant sculpture. It was like, you know, the kind of goofiest thing you can imagine. Um, but I had access to a lot of art supplies, and I had a lot of time on my hands, you know. And um, I did that for three years. And, and so there was a small group of us, and I guess the thing that was really nice about it was that um, we were sort of entertaining each other because there's not, you know, there's not a ton of artists and I was out of art school and they all of a sudden it's like they're down to like, you know, a dozen people in the city that I felt like were in my kind of group, you know. Um, but since we were alone, we were kind of like, we would do these, you know, that's when I started doing puppet shows and things like that. We were just, that's my point of all people. Um, we would do puppet shows and stuff like that to keep ourselves entertained. Um, and it was like nobody was watching us and I finally had time to kind of work on my own. So I felt kind of lost because I didn't have the direction of being in school anymore, you know, and somebody kind of like giving me assignments. But I also had this group of people I was kind of making worth wick, work with and work for, which was really lovely. Um, and again, since I was broke, um, and I just didn't feel, I didn't feel honest to make those big six foot or eight foot paintings anymore, you know, because I'm like working in my apartment. Like, why would I make these heroic kind of paintings? Um, while I was at the store, be dead all the time. So. Um, my biggest resources were, you know, markers and stuff I would just take off the shelves and use, um, which is why it's never good to buy them from the store. Um, but the, I had this great resource, which was these cutouts from the custom framing. We would have this, uh, whenever somebody would get custom framing done, they'd have the center what they cut out, and so we would just have these stacks and stacks and stacks of, like, colored boards. And so I would just sit around and not help people in the store and just draw all day. Um, you know, just take a couple of soft pencils. And so, you, can anyone guess what color, what color this is? Pittsburgh. Tons of Steelers. That's right. We had tons and tons because the Steelers would get all their stuff framed there. So I had like stacks and stacks of these weird gold, yellow drawings from all the cutouts from the Steelers printouts. You know. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, 
but I felt a little lost, and so I just started making books. Uh, books. I started making drawings about books I was reading, and um, I really got into adventure. Uh, in you know, I was always into history, and I started reading. I guess this is all based on uh, Bernal Diaz, who wrote a really great um, first-person account of the conquest of Peru. Um, and as he's, it was just going on forever. It's just like a, it's it's like 400 pages of doing that. And somehow, you know, I don't know, maybe because I had no, I wasn't. I wasn't like moving towards any point in my life. I kind of felt, I kind of felt like I really sympathized with these kind of like conquistadors, sort of like just wandering around, like in this dense overgrowth. So I just started making drawings, and I would draw all day this dead end job, and um, you know whatever came to mind. These are really small, like eight by ten, maybe or smaller. Yeah. So it's these overly kind of fecund. Um, you know, jungle scenes with tons of like bursting fruit and these kind of weird fat figures rolling through. You know. So again, I think partially I'm showing this stuff not because it's good, because maybe it's not, but um but maybe because uh it's a good way of showing that although I'm a painter, I really came at came at it through defining things and draftsmanship. You know, and, and and drawing all the time, but I had this kind of like loopy, double curving, impulsive hand, and it was really good for me to be in this place where I could only work on small things because I started to rein it in a little bit and kind of be a little bit more focused. Um, so it was a limitation that I had, and this kind of comes back to me again and again and again, a limitation that you know might have been it seemed as a liability at the time but actually became something that helped define what I was working on right by having size limitations by not having like paint and stuff I became um, I think a much better draftsman and so actually this past year I tried to make a I hadn't seen those I just dug those out of a drawer I found those old ones from whatever 2000 and one. Um, last year I just decided to make another couple of them so I started to make and I thought it would look the same but it doesn't look anything alike, I don't think, anymore, you know, which is kind of nice, I guess. This is what I just made recently. Um, I guess what the other side for this is that I, I titled them all uh, Los Jungalinos. And um, for some reason, uh, when it came time to, here's some ink drawings, just to show the hand. Much looser than what I'm doing now. Uh, and, and, and so I, I packed all these kind of uh, jungle drawings together. I, I, I titled them all like Los Jungalinos whatever, 1 through 86. And um, I, got, I used them to get into graduate school. I had no idea what the schools were good for. I didn't do any research. I just applied to three places, and I got into you know, a good school, and I, and I decided to go. And the odd aside for that is that I guess because the committee saw most Jungleese, which is not a Spanish word, any Spanish speakers? It's not a real word, right? No? Okay. Somebody thought I was, I was um, Mexican-American. And, uh, and sent all my stuff in for a uh, scholarship. And so I got a 60 something thousand dollar full tuition scholarship. You know, so I don't know who's more at fault, the people who sent it, the people on the committee who didn't, who couldn't like intuit that Los Jungalinos. Like I thought it was funny. Like I think it's a funny title because it's obviously an Americanized version, but I'm, I'm just putting that as exhibit D in the don't, but when people tell you it all happens for a reason. Bullshit. It does not all happen for a reason. Like sometimes you get lucky and sometimes it's great. If I would have had that sixty something thousand dollars of debt, I would have had it would have been more like a hundred thousand dollars of debt with interest and I wouldn't have been able to teach and I wouldn't be able to become a teacher and I would have had a different job, you know. Sometimes you gotta get lucky. Graduate school. Oh, graduate school? Again, doesn't really matter what I made. Um, I think what was really great about it was that um, it was like a blessing and a curse, but you sort of discover what ambition it, like ambition. Like, you, you know, I always loved it. I feel like it's something I was going to do my whole life, drawing, painting, but all of a sudden it becomes like you, you, you sort of learn what the wider world, like the bigger world of it is. And um, it's eye-opening, but it's also kind of daunting and like tremendously frightening, right? That it's like, oh, you see that there is this possibility that you can be a part of this like conversation, right? This art community. Um, and you're working with these people who are as invested as you are and you're trying to keep up with them and you're trying to do better than them and work with them. And um, I was always so laid back. It was really 
It was kind of like, it shook me up a little bit, you know? Um, I'm still not sure if that was good or not. Maybe it would have been better to stay in Pittsburgh and just work, work in the art supply store. But, um, you know, you can't go back. Um, I did also really learn how to be very critical of myself. And I learned that, you know, first I didn't necessarily understand the points of that, but now you see, like, if you want to do this your whole life, um, you got to spice it up. Like a good marriage, you've know, you got to, gotta, like, break up the routine, have a date night. Um, and first, outside of uh, That being said, you know, those of us who went to graduate school, we could say it's, kind, it's sort of like emotional torture in some sort of way. You have these two years, people kind of constantly uh, yelling at you that your work's terrible and then telling you it's great and then telling you it's terrible. When I got out, you know, I, um, I moved back to New York, which I never thought I would do. Um, but again, I felt uh, uh, really adrift. And I... Um, and that's when I fell in with my first major, like really major influence, uh, outside influence, which was Thor Heyerdahl, who is um, sort of a role model for me. Um, he's a, a Norwegian, I guess you would call him, I, if you want to be generous, you can call him an a, a, a experimental anthropologist. But I don't think that's really true. He, just, you know, he was an anthropologist who had this idea that the, the South Pacific was... Um, um, Populated by Peruvians. Instead of doing research, he just built a raft and took a bunch of his friends who were um, ex. Um, uh, what do you call them um, resistance, World War II resistance fighters. These guys were just bored. These were like the most adventurous guys in the world. They were just bored. And No, no cell phones, no radio, no nothing. It's like, yeah, I think it'll work. Book is really what um, he wrote a book called Contiki, and it's the most amazing book. It's pretty short. It's very readable, um, but it's just um, the sense of space in it is so. Um, otherworldly, right? He has absolutely like zero contact with, with anybody or anything. Uh, and there's this weird, some weird parts where like um, you know, he radio signals from California because it bounces off of the cloud. You know, he's in the middle of the Pacific and there's um, this infinite, you know, you know, like seemingly infinite amount of space below him and all these kind of ocean animals come up and sort of jump over the raft, you know, and he sort of explains seeing the night, the sky at night. And, and it just goes on. It's a couple hundred pages of just like drifting, drifting. And, and the narrative becomes of uh, how it works just becomes so, um, it's really magical, but in this kind of like very nonlinear way. You know he's going to end up in Pacific at some point. But the whole meat of it is just this kind of like floating netherworld. And so he has a lot of time to like reflect on kind of big things. Um, and so this kind of artist, adventurer, character. Um, it felt like just the perfect thing for me at that time when I didn't know what I was doing. And the nice thing was um, it gave me like a different conception of space than I had before. You know, so I started making these kind of like, um, almost like literally, you know, they were really about the continuity, but it was kind of a better, is it, it was as if they never made it to the Pacific and they just kind of, this is my conception of it, they just like floated for infinity, just like kept on going, and there would be like these new kind of adventures. And the raft was like this kind of little world, you know, that I could kind of like use as a uh, platform to like, you know, kind of um, let my imagination run with it, you know. And so sometimes things would be mundane, like they'd have to fit, fix a roof. Like this is just a little painting. I only, unfortunately, I only have a couple of images. I made, you know, dozens and dozens of these paintings. Um, you know, and this is before Life of Pi, by the way. I want to say that for the record. This is before that book came out. Um, I swear, you know, and so just like sometimes a ridiculous thing would happen or sometimes a dangerous thing would happen or sometimes a mundane thing would happen. Um, and it also gave me this kind of gateway to a weird, like oversimplified kind of ab abstracted space, you know, these kind of like flat planes. And I could kind of have this really off perspective, but still keep a really, um, make it still feel like a cohesive image, like that it, that there's some sort of logic to it. 
This is him uh, waiting for his pet parrot to return. You know, so I'm also playing a lot with narrative, so I wanted to make these paintings, and I think I can show you through these dusty paintings. Um, you know, and I was, the idea was to have paintings where you know, the main character is missing and can kind of never, you know, it's like uh, there's no action in the painting. Like you're supposed to be excited even though nothing really happens, and, you know, it's just about this thing, this absence. I don't know if it worked, but. Um, that expanded a little bit further. Still, this kind of like loose sense of space. They got a little heavy, heavier hand in them. You can kind of see this one, but um, I kept up with the adventure books, uh, and this kept building up steam for a long time um, about the Arctic, life in the Pacific. But that uneasy sense of place, you know, that like kind of finding a um, excuse to have a kind of like slightly illogical and kind of amorphous space, you know, I kept up with that rationale for a while. I don't necessarily even like these paintings anymore, um, but I thought it was an interesting decision to make. Just kind of like luridly colored and kind of willfully awkward paintings. There's another missing missing pet painting. That's one right Farmers market. Um, so. I'm, gonna, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna trying to just because I'm going long, right? Um, to, you know, I should say this kind of ran concurrently with like um, kind of unwarranted amount of success. I had like a, a bunch of shows kind of tightly in a row. And I don't necessarily think I got very lucky. I was like kind of the market um, they were looking for young people and I was um, making a certain type of work. So I didn't have a lot of time to reflect, you know, so I just kept on going along um, with these kind of adventure paintings uh, um, up until 2009. So maybe I'll just flip through them pretty quickly. They basically fell into three categories, life in the Pacific, uh, life in the Pacific life and life in the Atlantic were just sort of like weird, you know, kind of fake genre paintings um, about the tropics. Life in the Antarctic, uh, life in the Arctic rather which is about, you know, life in the Arctic. Um, and then Prehistoric Park, which was, I don't know, a really big series of paintings about a, um, uh, a theme park I was, would, you know, dreamt of building um, about, with, populated by the sort of statues of those antiquated kind of dinosaurs, like the dumb, the sort of dumb dinosaurs that dragged their tails and sort of looked were kind of like mean and, and sort of, you know, not the feathery new type of dinosaurs, but the old type of dinosaurs. And um, this coincided with a new job where I started, I got a sort of, um, almost a patronage job in, in a construction management firm in the city. So it was, again, I was kind of like back um, with this sort of rough crowd of my like, youth that I remembered, kind of like these kind of nasty, angry guys. And I was working um, in a job making probably more money than I make now. Um, um, I really hated this, this kind of job, dealing with construction and contractors and stuff. Um, but this idea of building, I was kind of like almost similar to how the Thor hired all paintings were going, but this idea of kind of like building a little world within the painting and then like referencing it came uh, out pretty strongly. So here's some others. You could see some of that Balthus stuff subsumed, right? This is a very Yonic painting. Um, here's from Prehistoric Park. So there would be fantastic, but there'd also be this element of and also kind of slightly based on ignorance, you know, like I wanted these guys to have like cavemen mixed with the dinosaurs, you know, it's going to be my theme park, we're going to do it my way. So this is from Life in the Pacific. Um, notions of awkwardness about race and misunderstanding um, sort of peeking in, you know, at this point too, something that came, comes up a lot more later, you know. Um, and kind of... I don't know if it was just a very low grade, very at this point very low grade homoeroticism. You know, with all men, it's like a world populated only by men, but not kind of. Uh, another influence, I guess, at this time. So I'm working that construction job, um, construction management, um, but at the same time, I actually. 
was able to um, go and see a lot of opera, almost every two weeks, probably, you know, sometimes even more than that. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of why, but let's just say I, I had this opportunity to get, you know, uh, to go for free, basically, to the Met um, fairly often with this group of people. And I had done it a little bit as a, when I was in high school, I had this chance again. And um, I don't know that I necessarily loved it, um, but it was this really, it was this kind of odd thing, and it was very compelling. Um, one thing I thought that was a really, uh, um, maybe has some sort of um, bearing on uh, my sort of method of research would be, um, I started going before they had those little teletype screens that would tell you the dialogue, like that would, in English, what they were singing in Italian or whatever. So what I would do is I would read the librettos like three or four times before we'd go, and then I try and match up the storyline as I understood it to what they were singing, you know. And it was almost as like me trying to go backwards and figure out like how the story should be staged. Like, oh, this definitely seems like the part where whatever's happening, or this definitely reminds me of this part. And then in between acts, I would go and read it again. Um, and I think that kind of idea of trying to backwards match uh, the, a storyline or lines of dialogue to like the visual end, like going backwards was kind of a really good training for me later on when I tried to stage my own narratives in a kind of really straightforward, almost like theater, theatrical way. Um, the other thing I loved about opera is obviously the sets, you know, this really more is more over the top um, kind of uh, um, spaces were obviously, were like instantly appealing to me. Uh, the other thing I loved is that they, they, these people all like looked like me. I mean, I was much bigger at the time, so, but it's just these like, kind of like, um, uh, um, this, the, I'm saying staginess because, but that's not what I mean. The, um, that kind of veil of un, unreality to it, since it's a stage rather than film, you know what I mean? Like they could, like the leads could be 400 pounds and be in love. Like I remember we saw Tristan and Isolde and they're supposed to be like 13 year old lovers and, and it was this like 400 pound lady, you know, and this is like real, this other guy. And I was like, this just doesn't seem like a 214, you know. I was meeting, but uh, like that was part of the magic, you know what I mean? That they were able to transcend it. And the thing that transcended the silliness was this, you know, was the music and the sets, right? It's like this most um, ingeniously and sort of artfully created sets. And these people who were like, I mean, they're kind of musical athletes, right? And when you're actually in the room with them, I mean, you kind of feel their breath, like the way they fill up this room with that song. Uh, it doesn't become silly anymore, you know? And, um, I think the silliness um, only heightens the discrepancy between the art, you know, and the, uh, um, between what they say they're doing, like, oh, I love you forever, right? And the sort of, like, the reality of the performance is so strong that I love that kind of discrepancy. That's the Kenneth Clark uh, line, I think, is something like, uh, what's too silly to be said should be sung, you know, can only be sung, which means, um, I don't know what it means. Don't worry about it. Think about it yourself. So uh, these spaces would come back later on in my work. Um, where does that bring me to? That brings me to uh, this painting, which was the last gouache painting I ever made um, in 2009, right? Um, we were about to have a child, my wife and I, and um, I felt fairly like I had been put through the, run the ringer in New York, right? Working construction and then also sort of um, trying to show my work as much as possible and dealing with this very cosmopolitan crowd. Um, I sort of had like a weird paranoid reaction to it. I felt like these people weren't necessarily on my side or maybe that wasn't the world. It felt like a very fake kind of world. Um, and so I had this kind of mild paranoia and I was really interested in this, you know, the stage setting and these scenes and I started thinking about, you know, hoaxes and filming the moon landing. Um, you know, like what that set would have looked like. And so I made this kind of weird black on black painting of the film of the filming of the moon landing. Um, you know, and it had a very different space than all the work I had done previously. Um, and I kind of liked that I was tipping my hand to that. It's artificial and it's created and it's just like this set. Um, I also felt like a recommitment, you know, I was having a child. I felt like this weird kind of recommitment to um, not making work really quickly. There's this kind of like pressure to make work very, very quickly. Um, I wanted to kind of like hunker down, you know, get back and um, 
really start just making work that I can invest a lot of time in each painting and like make each one a much more rich experience. This gouache was kind of like a water-based thing. It felt really quick. It felt kind of transient. So I started making egg tempers. Um, this is my studio at the time. Um, an egg temper is a process that takes a lot, lot longer than gouache painting or a lot of the other paintings. It's, um, and you also have to kind of make all your own paints, grind pigment. So you're kind of going to the source and getting these materials. Um, so there's a, real, a lot of investment, like literally, and, and, and literally money-wise, but also in time. Um, and it's also, to make each of the shapes, you kind of have to go back over the shapes over and over again to like build up the solid color. So you're almost like really committing to each of the, um, this is an example here from Sienna. You're really committing to each of the things that you put in this painting, right? You're like describing each thing and you're like, well, this is going to take me a while, so I better make sure this is the right thing, right? I felt like um, I had to be kind of wiser and more deliberate about my choices. It also brought me back to um, a, a, a type of historical painting that was a really big influence in me when I, when I was in Italy. And um, I had kind of not forgotten about, but it hadn't really meant a lot because I, to me, because I spent so much time with people my own age, I felt like, uh, in graduate school and stuff. And we were thinking about the future, and I felt like it was shunned, you know, you weren't allowed to think about the past, or it wasn't a good idea, right? We're supposed to, like, know every artist of our generation, like, every obscure, we're supposed to know what gallery they're from. You know, and I always loved history, and so I started paying more attention and going back and relearning more about Sienese painting, which is an early medieval Italian painting, also mostly done in egg tempera. And I think um, maybe art would have been fine if it had stopped there and there was no renaissance. Um, uh, here's a painting I made. This is one of the first sort of egg tempers I started making again. Um, you know, and it was also very, very heavily invested in narrative, right? They were all these pictures, they're small, they're all about storytelling. They're made for the public, but they're also of a really personal size, you know, they're like these really small things. That was really appealing to me. Um, you know, and they had elements of, uh, like sort of elements of mythology, they had elements of magic, right? There's no perspective, not, th not that there's no perspective, there's no linear perspective, so I feel like a lot of the spaces are really inventive. I mean, this is just one example, but sort of the way the space um, flattens out as you go back is really kind of beautiful. And um, I think in an earlier time, I would have thought that maybe it was naive, but it has a lot of sophistication to it. You just sort of have to learn the language. Um, I, I shouldn't diagram these because point being like this, uh, and now I will do that thing that I just did. So in this particular painting, you can see how there's like you know uh, several instances of time. You know, there's where Saint Anthony flies in. There's a sort of like when you are not left the stage and then the sort of baby gets smushed. I guess he falls out of bed. I don't know what happens. St. Anthony swoops down, and then there's this kind of resolution at the bottom. So it's a really kind of complicated mixture of, you know, um, what's happening in the painting, the pattern, and this kind of weird tilting spaces, and a kind of complicated storytelling, right, that it really appealed to me. Oh, geez. And so Sini's painting, also, I think, I, I was really, I'm going to use the term blessed. I was blessed and lucky to also um, watch this movie for the first time which is called Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Um, so I'm looking at Sini's painting, and it's this movie that just like blew my mind. I, you know, I'd never seen it. And it, was the, it sounds like the worst idea. It, it really sounds like the worst idea of any movie that could ever be made. And this is like right after my, wa uh, my wife. This is right after my wife had our first uh, daughter, Greta, and I didn't have a lot of time to paint for three months. And it was like, kill, you know, it was killing me. I had no time to paint. And I saw this movie, you know, and I just like, you know, tears coming down my face. It seems like the worst idea. It's a uh, Abbott and Costello are old time comedy team, you know? Um, one guy is the kind of goofy, funny guy, and the other guy's the straight man, right? He's the kind of like the rock solid. He's the one that the jokes bounce off of. And somebody at the studio decided to pair them up with Dracula, Frankenstein, and, and who else was in it? The Wolfman, you know? They're like, well, we need to make a story. Like, you know, it's obviously somebody said, the executive said, we, need, we have Abbott and Costello for one more movie, uh, and we also need to use these guys. Make a story that fits these two things, you know? Sounds like it was terrible, but the movie is, is, is funny, 
And also these kind of very kind of bizarre scenarios happen where sometimes the monsters are in like 1950s America and other times Abbott and Costello are in back and forth and the space will change and that will change how the characters are seen. Um, so even just like a little, I mean I couldn't find a lot of pictures but there is uh, these beautiful sets because you know at that time they were making the movies on the lots. <coughs> So there'd be these beautiful sets to try and contain these like completely incongruous elements, you know, and wackiness would ensue. So being as this happened at the same time as I didn't have time to paint, um, I had this feeling like it gave me an answer to like, you know, I had all these ideas I wanted to do and the, no time to do it, you know. So I decided to like try and find a, a way to create the space in which all of the elements that I want could like work together, right? Kind of like Abbott and Costello and Frankenstein, you know? Just like throw everything in. Before it was like I'd make an adventure painting, I'd make a painting about the Pacific, I'd make another painting. And I was like, you know, we do not have time for this anymore, Chris. We need to like get all these guys together in a room and like let them slug it out. Um, and it was, it was tremendously liberating. Like it was just the best thing that could have happened to me. I felt like, um, you know, I could trust my instincts in a way. You know, I felt like I was a good enough artist to be able to just sort of like come up with these narratives and then go backwards and try, I mean this is a really new painting, it's not from that time, but it's still following that same program. Um, to kind of like let this associative thinking be okay, like jump from one idea to the next idea, next idea, and then the, the difficult part was like trying to carve out a space that it could all make sense. This is one from relatively recent, recently, but um, follows the same format. Right. And I don't think that that is very far away from what's happening in these paintings, you know. And I think these paintings were probably not looking at opera, but miracle plays, right. And they understood what creating a stage was like and how you could sort of um, pervert the architecture to kind of like heighten the drama or whatever, comedy. This is probably 2008. So I was really, I mean, this is something I'm kind of proud of. I was really committing to like these kind of silly encounters. That was my first painting about LA, I think, too. I didn't know I was going to move here, but that's what I thought it looked like. What? No? Okay. So I would, I would just basically allow the things I was reading and the books I was listening to to just kind of like filter in, you know? So this guy's gorgeous George. Sort of like um, he was a, a heel. He was a bad guy, and he had like these beautiful curls. And he was like he was a tough guy, but he was very feminine. He had these silk robes, and so everyone hated him. He was this really weird wrestler, very popular, but also kind of hated. Um, and then he's getting beat up by a ghost cat. I guess I can go into where those came from, but I'll just let that be a mystery for the sake of time, right? And I think you could sort of see where those Sienes paintings, these kind of tight spaces. Right, creating stuff out of the carved rocks, you know, I kind of stole that. Bye, Stephanie. Um, again, recent, still following the same kind of format. This is the ghost of, this is the ghost of Christmas present, and uh, I forgot what his name was, the old, mixed with Sputnik the wrestler, Memphis wrestler. That's also Cal. I made I made this recently, so that's that's this is legitimate California palm trees. I had seen a palm tree by the time I made these three. I had not seen a palm tree when I made these two. It's Richard Nixon um, on Easter Island, which originally was supposed to be a painting about Margaret Mead and coming of age in Samoa. I don't know if you guys read that. Who took history, sociology class? Didn't work out. Uh, Cosmetesque flooring, I'm going to throw that in there also. It's a um, 12th century Italian, again medieval Italian, um, type of flooring. This beautiful floor, this is a diagram of what a, an entire cathedral floor would look like. These beautiful floors made out of scraps of uh, marble from other eras. eras. can't pronounce that word. Um, but I just remember thinking it was this like beautiful but also like the saddest kind of like sweet thing that they were like kind of carving up their previous sort of successes. You know, it's this really dark time, you know, it's like bad time in history. 
and they're kind of like chipping away the scraps of this like former eras and like making it, combining it into something uh, really beautiful. And for some reason I found it uplifting and also it reminded me of how I was kind of making these paints by grinding up these different stones and minerals. So that kind of like patterning and piling and just excuse to make And it kind of functions in the way the water and the ocean and rivers function in some of those earlier paintings, in that it was this kind of like excuse to have a really uh, undulating kind of, the, the place that's supposed to be the most solid, the floor, making it uh, uh, the kind of most unstable and most electric. There's, that's me. Last one, I, I'm sorry that we're going long, but you guys like this, so just stick around. Um, the last kind of outside influence I would say for now would be, um, and this is really recently, and I, I think it's made a big difference in my life and in my work, is um, my dog Tulip, or my father and myself, uh, two of the four books by um, Ackerley, Joseph, uh, Joseph Ackerley, this really great British writer who, um, he was a liter liter literature, literary editor for the British ma BBC magazine his whole life. Um, so he kind of like produced all of and published all these great mid-century British writers, but he only wrote four books. Um, and I started reading his books around the same time that I um, started reading George Orwell's essays. I had read some of his nonfiction stuff earlier, Homage to Catalonia and some other books, but uh, um, Down and Out in Paris and London, which is a really beautiful book as well. But he has a, there's this a package of essays called um, Facing Unpleasant Facts, you know. And it was this great book of essays about um, during World War II. He was like, he decided that his, the most important thing to do would be to be, crit, always to be a critic, right? Like to always kind of um, be that mirror to society. And so during World War II, when Britons were all banding together, he just spent all of his time writing these like harshly critical essays. And I thought it was such a weird, like counterintuitive, but also kind of like forthright uh, way of working. And you know, a lot of the stuff he said was really true and he really saw clearly what was going on. And I thought there was something really honorable about kind of like pinching a sore spot, you know, in that case. And um, Ackerley is a much more personal um, series of books. My Dog Tulips is, is, it really is the most beautiful book ever written and I'll fight anybody who says differently. It's um, unsem unsentimental and a lot of it, it's all just about his relationship with a dog that he gets, right? Um, it's very unsentimental. And, and like there's an entire chapter about like her, her, her bathroom habits, you know? But it's written in this very dry way. And yet somehow there's, it's really melancholy. It's like a very sad book. And it's just this guy, um, something very slowly turns it. And when you realize like, oh, this isn't really just about his dog, right? And he was gay and he had this sort of uh, uh, um, difficult relationship with his own sexuality. And he sort of like rents this dog and decides he's going to give this dog that he has, he's going to give her a full sort of like heterosexual life. And he just needs to get this dog. She needs to have babies. Like she needs to have pups. So he goes around from like person to person, tries to find the perfect mate for his dog. And you could just tell how much he loves this dog, but he's doing this like ridiculous thing and it's not working out. Every dog that he introduces her to like it just doesn't, you know, it turns out like a disaster. And in the end he realizes that she loves him, you know, and, and, and she thinks that he's his partner. And it gets in this really bizarre place where it's just like, it almost steps over this line, you know. Um, but the writing style is really dry. Like it's just, it's just kind of factual. And then you get, and like all of a sudden you realize like how did we get to this, well like how did we get to this place? Like I don't, you know, I'm not comfortable anymore. And, um, and it was just so weirdly honest and British in that way. And I thought, like, this was just a sort of um, oddly brave. And, like, I, I thought it had, I, I still don't really, under, I'm going to read it again soon because I still don't feel like I understand the full implication of that book. And um, My Father and Myself is another one where he tries to um, document his father's life. Um, and it turns out he had a second family and all these interesting things. And midway through the book, he realizes, he, you know, he doesn't have any facts. He doesn't have any information. He never asks any questions about it to his dad. And now all of a sudden he has to, um, he just decides, well, I guess, you know, you can't really know people. And it's, and it's more about regretting not knowing something. They do write this book. And then he just starts to talk about his own life in this really kind of graphic and very sad way. And I just thought there was something w weirdly uh, brave. Like, you would start a project that fails and he still, you know, that is a, a memoir of his dad's life, or a biography of his dad, 
and then t kind of turns it on himself. And so it's like this failed project that somehow in the end becomes like um, really vivifying and beautiful, even though it was a complete disaster as a biography. Um, so some of that, this is a big influence on where I am now, you know, thinking about how to delve a little deeper and maybe start to work on subjects that I'm not comfortable with or maybe I don't understand and like maybe make something out of that ignorance, kind of like the way he made something out of the ignorance in my father and myself where he didn't know about his dad but he somehow turned it into something. And so I did a series of paintings and this is kind of bringing me back to the beginning of the talk where I tried to imagine what kind of an artist I would be if I had uh, grown up in a different culture, you know. So, um, and, and I was working with all these people from different places and I knew lots of people. So this is if I would have been from Trinidad, I, I think I would have been a shell carver. You know, this is kind of me. I mean, it's also kind of a weird sort of, you could read into it how you want, but um, I also thought like, you know, I felt like I, I should be perfectly fine at being able to make paintings about being white. You know, I felt like there was this weird thing where do something that I feel like, you know, it's obviously a big part of my life, right? You know, and I feel like maybe um, we think about history, we think about what, um, that's if I was born in the South. I'm a ceramicist. And if I was born in the West, we're too long. Oh my goodness, I like to talk. Um, we only got a few more slides. Let's just go through it real quick. Making paintings about aging, like that sort of last stage of life, which is something I was around a lot at the time because I was living with a lot of people in their 90s, you know? Um, sort of creating mythology. That's actually Pete Seeger, right? Remember I was talking about sort of identifying with conquistadors in those novels? Uh, they had a habit of garroting. That was their, like their way of public execution. I thought there was something oddly sexualized about that, you know, going over and picking up these people and sort of further complicating it. I'm just going to spin through these, but this is where I'm at now. Um, there's a Prophet Muhammad, and it was supposed to be Iggy Pop, I think, at some point, and it changed, and at a Clinton fundraiser. You know, something you're not supposed to make paintings of, which seems to me the most ridiculous thing, you know. Um, so I figured might as well do it. Yeah. That's me assassinating uh, General Robert E. Lee. And the, um, you know, I had to give a talk in the South, in Memphis. This, this, this part was much more difficult to do. Um, yeah, so different versions of white, sort of sublimated racism, uh, violence and sexuality kind of clashing together, and bright colors. Yeah? Okay, there we go, that's it. Sorry I went long, sorry I went long. Yeah. All right.